your second set of bird video notes, we're going to focus on the internal structures and reproduction of birds. So first, let's talk about the skeleton. We know that birds have very lightweight bones, and this is because they need to be able to fly. So if their bones were very dense and heavy, they wouldn't be able to fly like they do. But they're still strong, even though they're lightweight. They have a bill, of course. Their neck is flexible. As you see, I'm sure you've seen birds that turn their heads all the way around to help clean themselves. And their feet make them able to nest and feed their young. They also have specific structures that make their neck so flexible. For example, they have a saddle-shaped cervical vertebrae. And the first vertebrae has a single occipital condyle, which allows the neck to rotate around quite far. The skeleton itself also includes a pelvic girdle, a vertebral column, and the ribs that are all strengthened for flight. So the sensacrum helps maintain that proper flight posture, but it also supports the bird when they're doing their landing or you've seen them hopping or walking. The pigo style is important for the steering during flight. So the sternum itself has a very large keel, and that's because it's for the attachment of flight muscles. If you've ever cut a turkey or cut a chicken, you've seen that that sternum's pretty large, and it's because those flight muscles come across and they attach to that sternum. The furcula, which is the wishbone, so I'm sure lots of you have split a wishbone with someone before, this is also an additional site of attachment for those flight muscles. So there's also some appendages that birds have that are important. So they have perching tendons that run from the toes all the way back across the back of the ankle to the muscles of the lower leg. So when the ankle joint flexes, the foot is going to grip a perch. And this is also why birds can perch and sleep and not fall off the perch. So the muscles of birds are also very well adapted for flight. So the largest and strongest muscles birds even have are for flight, and though they contract very quickly but fatigue slowly. Many birds fly very, very far distances, and they have to be able to do this with their muscles. So the muscles have lots of mitochondria, make lots of ATP, which is made from breaking down food into energy. And what's interesting to see is that domestic fowl breeds, so chickens, for example, are bred for massive amounts of muscle, which is that white meat. Although chickens end up having so much muscle that the rest of their body can't handle it and they can't fly like normal birds can. So in terms of the digestive system, most birds have a very ravenous appetite. So they are always eating and always pooping, but it helps support that high metabolic rate, which makes flight possible. They also have a wide array of bills and tongues depending on how they eat. So woodpeckers, for example, have a barbed tongue, which helps grab grubs from tree bark. Sap suckers have a brush-like tongue and they lick sap. And then hummingbirds, their tongue actually rolls up into a tube and that's for help getting nectar out. The bills are also modified based on food source. So an eagle has a very sharp bill because they're going to be tearing their prey, while a cardinal, they're cracking seeds. So their bill is very strong, but not big and sharp. And flamingos, as you can see down here in this picture, their bill is for straining food from water. Birds also have something called a crop. Now, if you remember from earthworms, we talked about a crop and a gizzard and earthworms. Well, birds also have the same thing. So they'll gorge on food, eat lots and lots and lots of food, and it's stored in the crop. And then as it's digested, it goes into the gizzard. And this is more of a behavioral based thing because a lot of times birds are very prone to being prey. So if they find food, they're gonna eat lots and lots of food and then they go fly somewhere or hide somewhere where they can actually digest that food. The stomach of birds then has two major regions. So they have a proventriculus and the ventriculus. So the proventriculus is where those gastric juices are secreted to initiate that digestion process from the crop. The ventriculus is in the gizzard, and that has muscular walls, and that's going to actually crush those seeds and break up the food they eat. But it's also important to note that birds swallow sand, rocks, other small things because it helps them with that digestion and to break their food up. So if you look in this chicken over here, you see the crop and then through that part of the stomach into the gizzard where it gets crushed. So bird circulation is also more advanced from the vertebrates we've been discussing thus far. So birds have four chambers. They're going to have two atria and two ventricles, and they have a very rapid heart rate to support that, their high metabolic rate. 
In terms of gas exchange, birds have something called a syrinx, which is a special voice box. So this helps them, obviously, with their bird vocalizations, bird songs, how they communicate, how they can talk to other birds or different species. And this gas exchange is also associated with their flight, once again. So everything goes back to flight with birds. So their high metabolic rates in flight mean they also have to consume a greater amount of oxygen than any other vertebrate. And interestingly enough, if you think about it, they also fly at very high altitudes. And there's not as much oxygen at these high altitudes, so they have to have a continuous movement of air over their respiratory surfaces to make sure they get what they need. In terms of the nervous and sensory systems, they have a much larger forebrain than reptiles. So this is much more developed, and we see this because birds have much more developed processes in terms of visual learning, their feeding, their courtship, and their nesting. These are all things reptiles really don't do. Vision itself is also an important sense to birds. So the structure in their eyes is similar, but the size of their eyes is much larger. So birds have much larger eyes compared to the size of their heads compared to other vertebrates. And birds of prey, like this eagle down here, they can actually even stay focused on prey during a very fast ascent to get it. So for bird vision, they have rods and cones, and the rods are active under low light, and cones are active under high light. So they're concentrated at this point called the fovea, and some birds actually have two of those fovea per eye. So they have a search fovea, which is kind of that wide angle to see everything, and then they have a pursuit fovea, which gives them binocular vision and depth perception. Birds also have a nictating membrane, and this is something that's on reptiles, and it helps draw that over the surface of the eye to cleanse and protect it. So birds need to have their vision in tip-top shape, so this helps them keep their eyes clean. Olfaction, or sense of smell, is a very minor role in birds, though. So they really rely on their vision, but they really don't rely on their smell, except turkey vultures, who actually locate their prey, or dead prey, by smell. Birds do have well-developed hearing, though, on the other hand, and the sensitivity has actually been compared to the human ear. And they have these feathers called auriculars that's over the external opening of their ear. So it covers it, but it also helps them keep that sensitivity because it's protected. And here's just a closer look. You can see the auricular feathers that are there over the ear. So for excretion, birds excrete very similar to reptiles. So they have uric acid, which is temporarily stored in the cloaca. So birds also have a cloaca. They have a common opening for waste, and their eggs come out of that opening as well. So when they excrete uric acid, they're conserving water. Remember, reptiles moved away from water, unlike amphibians, so they needed to conserve water. So this has continued on to birds as well. But it also helps promote that embryo development. And some birds even that are marine, they can actually drain excess sodium chloride or salts out of their nasal openings to help conserve water. So for bird reproduction, they have several very prominent activities that you see. So they establish territories, they find mates, they construct nests, they incubate eggs, which is very widely associated with birds, and they feed their young. So all birds are oviparous, and this should not be a new term for you. We discussed this term when we were talking about fish, and they do establish their territories prior to mating, and they will defend them. That's where they're going to raise their young, so they're going to defend that territory. In the male reproductive system, they have paired testes, so these enlarge during the breeding season, and they help move the coil tubes move the sperm to the cloaca, which is where they make contact with the females. So that sperm is transferred by direct cloacal contact in most birds, and as you see down here in these pictures. And there's just a closer look at the male reproductive system. And take a look at breeding season versus non-breeding season and how enlarged those organs are. The female reproductive system is a little bit different than what we would think. So they initially do form two ovaries, but one only fully develops, and it's usually the left ovary that fully develops in birds. So the egg's going to get fertilized in the upper portion, and then it's going to go through the passage into the lower region where a shell is added. And then that once again opens to that cloaca, that common opening for release. 
Here's a look at the female reproductive system. So in terms of reproduction themselves, most birds are monogamous, but there are a couple other kinds we're going to talk about too. So monogamous meaning they mate with the same single female. Males mate with one female during breeding season. And actually, swans, geese, and eagles, they will mate for life. And the advantages of this are nest building and care of young. So they are both contributing to raising those offspring, and it's a good environment to make sure they're all getting food and cared for like they should. Some birds, on the other hand, are polygonous, and this means that males are going to mate with more than one female, and then the females are stuck caring for the young. So this tends to occur when resources are patchy, and an example of this is prairie chickens, like you see here. A few birds are also, also polyandrous, which means the females mate with more than one male. So females, in this case, are larger, and they defend the territory, the males go into the role of building the nest and caring for the eggs. And an example here is sandpipers. So that nest construction then is going to begin after they form a pair. And the nest construction is usually initiated by the female. So the term clutch is referring to a group of eggs then that's laid by a female and they have to be incubated. So the female usually sits on them. And it just depends on the species. It can be anywhere from 10 to 80 days. And one to two days before hatching, though, you will see that baby bird start to poke out, like you see in this picture, and then it will eventually break out of the shell. So there's two types of baby birds, then. There's altricial young, which are entirely dependent on their parents. They are naked when they hatch. They don't know where to get food. They live in a nest, and the, the parents come feed them, such as the American robins you see here. Precocial young, on the other hand, are alert and lively at hatching. They run, walk, swim, they're covered in feathers. Their parents will guide them to food and shelter, but they could still survive on their own in terms of feeding if they had to. And reproduction and development, just a, one final thought on birds, is birds do live a very brief life in nature. So it's very important that they invest in their young, that way there's more survival because mortality is very high in the first year from both predators and weather. So birds do have a very rough life. They don't live very long, but they do invest a lot in their offspring. And that is it for your notes.